Hello, this is Kerry Schutz with MathWorks. In this video, I'm going to show a quick and dirty method for characterizing a linear system using random noise as the excitation. The goal is to get the magnitude and phase response of our device under test. Now, typically for such a measurement, you would use something called a network analyzer. That's a two-channel measurement device that has its own excitation. Uh, it can excite the device and it can also measure the excitation, it can measure the response, and then you form a proper ratio of measurement as noted on the block Y of S over U of S, and then from that you can extract the magnitude and the phase response. However, what we're showing here, um, we're going to limit ourselves. We're going to impose the constraint that we only have access to a spectrum analyzer and we can only measure one channel, let's say the output, and from that single channel measurement, uh, we want to deduce a reasonably good estimate of the uh, of the transfer function of y of s over u of s. So we'll see how far we can take this uh, as we go along the process. We'll see that we can get uh, so far, um, but you know there's going to be definite limitations uh, in this measurement approach. Let's just see how far we can go. Now, if you'll note over here in MATLAB, I have a number of variables already defined, and these are variables which uh, this model is going to pick up and use, like averaging factor, bandwidth, forgetting factor, sample rate, etc. So let's open up this script, and you'll see exactly where all these variables are set. The first thing I do is define uh, my device under test using this TF function from control system toolbox. It defines a transfer function, and we can go over here in MATLAB and just type a capital H and see what it looks like. It's a second order system, both in the numerator and denominator. It's a continuous time system. I'm gonna analyze that system over some bandwidth, 10 kilohertz. I'm gonna sample it uh, at some sample rate, which in this case has to be at least two times higher than the uh, single-sided bandwidth of 10 kilohertz. So we're gonna go with 25.6 kilohertz. Uh, we'll be taking FFTs and doing spectrum analysis using a 1024 uh, point FFT size, and then we're going to do some spectral averaging uh, on those FFTs, uh, averaging factor of 10, but a forgetting factor of 1 minus 1 over 10 or 0 0.9. Now, typically, um, we'd like to do some uh, upfront analytical work to form some expectations about what the magnitude and phase response of the system would look like uh, before we jump into the measurement. So, um, that way we have some reference to compare against and we know the right answer before we start in this particular case. And to do that, we're gonna leverage the Bode function from uh, Control System Toolbox to look at the magnitude and the phase response. So let's run that section of code and we'll see that this is a notch filter with the notch uh, placed at one kilohertz and that was no accident. You can see over here, we placed a, a notch here at 183 when we formed the transfer function numerator. And then the phase response uh, also has this 180 degree phase shift at the notch frequency and it's increasing phase lag as we go into the notch and decreasing phase lead as we exit the notch. So that is what theory says. And now we want to use these same uh, measurement parameters in our model in our measurement test bench and see if we can reasonably close duplicate uh, that theory using empirical means. Okay, so we're gonna run this model for 100 seconds and we're gonna see uh, you know, what we get on our spectrum analyzer. All right, so here's our spectrum analyzer of the uh, magnitude uh, of the output, the uh, basically the power spectrum of the output. And we can see right off the bat that we're doing a decent job. We've got something that looks like a notch response. Um, it's a little noisy, yes, uh, but you know, you can say that Without too much work, we were able to use this noise source and, and a spectrum analyzer and get something that looked like the theoretical uh, magnitude response. Notice we don't have a phase response here. And as we'll see, um, you know, phase is a much tougher measurement to make on a spectrum analyzer. And in fact, most spectrum analyzers that don't have a, um, a phase measurement mode. Um, and the reason for that is, well, it's typically a phase with respect to what, and in this case, we don't have anything with measured with respect to um, the way we've set up our measurement. So right now we're going with just magnitude only, and we see, okay, it looks like a notch, uh, but it lo does look noisy, and it also looks like the level is off. So again, this is an, uh, a spectrum measurement in dB watts. It's not a ratioed measurement. We're trying to emulate 
a ratio of measurement uh, on, again, a spectrum analyzer, which is already faulty in and of itself. Uh, but if we wanted to scale it as a transfer function measurement, we could say, well, we could assume we know something about the input. We could say, okay, it's Gaussian zero mean unit variance. It's a, like a one watt input with the sample time here of one over 25, uh, 600 to 25.6 uh, kilohertz sample rate. Okay, with that in mind, we know it's one watt and we know how we're breaking it up over multiple FFT bins. We could kind of compute the uh, dB watt level from that and, and reference it against that. So this block here waiting in the wings is, is doing just that. I can um, kind of get the scaling right just for aesthetic reasons. And what it does is essentially says, well, uh, I know it's one watt input. I know the FFT size is this. I know we're using a, uh, a HAN window with a uh, normalized effective noise bandwidth factor, a correction factor of 1.5. I know these things. Uh, this is the double-sided to single-sided factor two. Um, with all those factors in mind, I, I know what my input level is. So I can just pre-compute that and reference against it. And so I'll do that. And so that'll help clean up the level and bring it up to like a zero dB reference, you know, so we can pretend this is dB gain as opposed to an absolute level. Okay, so that that's okay. Um, what about the noise? It was certainly with more averaging, you can usually uh, clean up the noise, uh, form a tighter spectral estimate. And so instead of using that averaging factor of 10, I'm really uh, gonna crank it up to 1,000. We'll run that section of code. So I don't have to go in now to the model or the spectrum analyzer, certainly, I could have gone into the spectrum analyzer and just hard coded 0 0.999 or some factor. Uh, same way with the FFT, I could hard code in some number, but using the script, it just allows me to do it uh, a little bit quicker, especially if I'm changing that parameter in multiple locations in the model. So let's run it with more averaging and see what effect that has. Hopefully it has an improved uh, result in, on the spectral estimate. Indeed, it did uh, smooth out the estimate quite a bit. And so now uh, we can start seeing okay exactly how good or how bad this, this this estimate is so to do that let's take advantage of our zoom in zoom out features let's zoom in on the pass portion of the filter uh, what you what we see is hmm, it's not exactly um, a zero db uh, response um, in the uh, pass portion of the filter and you might say well maybe we've got the wrong correction factor you know, lots of possible discrepancies here. Um, but in this case, now our correction factor is correct, and we've actually got a 1 dB gain here um, as measured uh, in the past portion beyond uh, a few kilohertz. It looks okay around uh, DC, uh, so that much is good. Um, so we got one discrepancy. If we zoom in on the main feature of interest to our notch filter, and that's the notch location, it looks like it's coming in about 50 hertz off at 0.95 kilohertz or 950 hertz, not a kilohertz. So that's also a discrepancy to have some concern about. Now, as it turns out in this model, um, we are suffering from aliasing and that is the root of our um, measurement being a little off in the uh, pass portion and a little off in terms of the uh, notch location. So this is where it'd be really easy to make, make a mistake if you uh, placed a lot of faith in your measurement setup and you didn't necessarily trust the specification you were given uh, for this device under test, you might believe the measurement because, well, it seems close and, well, maybe the specification's just off somewhere, manufacturing or tolerances, etc. cetera. Um, or you might say, well, um, no, it's, you know, it's something else. Maybe it's my limited FFT resolution. In this case, I've got 37.5 hertz of resolution bandwidth. So you can immediately go back and test that that theory out quickly by just saying, well, let's just bump up the FFT size by a factor of say four. Uh, we'll run that section of code and just see what happens. So I'll, I'll run this uh, by pushing play right on the spectrum analyzer. And we see we have more points that much makes sense since we've got an improved spectral resolution down here, just over nine Hertz. Uh, but if we zoom in on the notch, it really doesn't get closer to one killer. In fact, if anything, it got a little further away. So that wasn't the root cause of our 
um, notch discrepancy. So I'm going to go back and just use our original baseline FFT value since that wasn't the problem. So what could it be? Again, I said aliasing. So yes, indeed, it is aliasing. That's uh, the culprit in terms of the passband being off and the notch being off. So what's happening is um, we have a very, very high bandwidth input. Um, it's a perfect discrete time signal we're modeling here. And this is where you can get into trouble in a simulation environment where perhaps on the bench you could get away with this and, uh, you know, you'll, you'll never see this problem exactly because generating perfect discrete time signals with zero rise time, zero fall time is essentially impossible on the bench itself. But in a simulation, again, it's easy to do. So I've turned on sample time colors. We can see the sample time on the input signals, 25.6 kilohertz, and we sample the output at 25.6 kilohertz with a continuous time signal between. So those transitions definitely have some repercussions here, one of them being aliasing. So if you recall from a theory, when you have a perfectly uh, discrete time signal, uh, you get not just the signal of interest in your, in your bandwidth of interest, let's say from plus and minus FS over two, uh, you also get all the spectral replicas as spaced at the sample rate. So spaced every 25.6 kilohertz up and down the frequency axes. That's very high frequency. So we would like to uh, remove those. So let's um, get rid of those higher frequency components as, as seen by our device under test. I'm going to uncomment this um, anti-alias filter, which has a uh, it's elliptic low pass eighth order with a bandwidth of 10 kilohertz and a certain pass band ripple certain stop band attenuation and to visualize also uh, the effect of that th there's an implicit zero order hold in the system i'm going to uncomment the spectrum analyzer which is sampling the input at uh, 10 times the rate of the input so this is going to give us a feel an approximation for an analog zero order hold on this top spectrum analyzer. Again, that's gonna let, let us see what the device under test sees, at least a close approximation to it. So now let's run this model and we'll look at the two spectrums and we'll see, um, we'll get a little more insight on the system. Okay, so uh, on top, we see this sine X over X shape uh, and we notice we're going out to 128 kilohertz, not 12.8 kilohertz FS over two. We see nulls at the sample rate or integer multiples thereof. And what we also see in the passband in this zero to 10 kilohertz region of most interest is a few dB of roll off. And that few dB of roll off is due to the zero order hold effect implicit in the um, discrete to continuous interface. Now, if we look at the output, now there's good news and bad news here. The good news is it looks like we've refined our notch estimate so indeed the uh, anti-aliasing or the anti-aliasing filter had a positive effect so it was aliasing if we go back and look at the past portion well not great news um, we see uh, attenuation not gain that we had before about one db before now we've got about a db or two of attenuation we've got roll off and we have ripple and these are all effects that are not part of the device under test. They're part of our measurement setup. They're part of the anti-alias filter. Uh, they're part of the implicit zero order hold effect, et cetera. So these are sort of side effects uh, of the way we've constructed our system. And again, it's a uh, single channel measurement that has all of the goodness and the sins of everything that's upstream from the spectrum analyzer, all amalgamated into one spectral view over here. So the ripple here is due to the ripple on our elliptic filter in the passband. It's a plus and minus 0 0.5 dB ripple spec. So that's the undulations you see here. Uh, the roll off is this zero order hold droop that we see here in the passband. And of course, the anti-aliasing filter does not remove that. That's part of our passband. So that comes through. Um, so yeah, that we can't really uh, completely avoid um, that with this limited measurement setup. And again, we don't have phase in this measurement either. Another downside, it's, it's sort of a casualty of this measurement setup. Uh, for phase, typically you measure it with respect to something. In this case, it would be the input, and we're not really measuring it or factoring it into this measurement. Uh, the phase of a noise source, uh, really from sample to sample, is unpredictable. 
And so we can't just pre-compute phase and, you know, factor it into the measurement. We would actually have to measure it directly, form a proper two-channel ratio transfer function measurement, and compute the phase response from that. That'll all come in a future video on this uh, same topic. Uh, but for now, I just wanted to kind of show what you could get away with, uh, with how little and how quickly and easily you could do it using nothing more than a noise source and a spectrum analyzer. So anyway, until next time, thank you for uh, tuning in.